Hi, this is Anthony. Welcome back to my show. Before we start, I want you to make a promise and you can make it silently to yourself. You don't have to tell anybody else, but I want you to promise that when you take any information, whether it's about D.B. Cooper specifically or about anything else in life, take it with a grain of salt. Ask yourself, does it make logical sense? If it doesn't make logical sense, then is it likely? But even if things make logical sense, is it factually correct? Can you find other information, hopefully from original sources, that indicate that the fact that you have, the fact that you're making your conclusions on, is really a true fact? Or has the information somehow been garbled or corrupted over time? I want you to do that for everybody that you listen to, including myself. I'm not going to lie or mislead you. Of course, if I was, I would lie and say that I'm not. But if you watch my videos and think about what I say, you can make your own determinations on whether I'm an honest person. But even honest people can make mistakes, and I'm certainly capable of making mistakes. And I try to look for primary sources or confirming sources when I use a piece of information, but sometimes I don't. Sometimes I base my beliefs on facts on what has been stated by other people. Again, let's be cognizant that those facts may not be completely true, and therefore my conclusions may be in error. I think that when you're dealing with the D.B. Cooper case or anything else, we need to be humble and realize that even with a lot of clues, we don't have all the information. And a lot of clues can turn out to be red herrings when we find cases that actually are conclusively solved. That being said, let's launch into today's Q&A. Today I'm going to look at just one message that I received from a viewer. There's a lot of comments and questions in it, so it will fill up a lot of time to discuss. I'm going to put the whole comment that I've received in the show notes so that you can read it yourself, but I'll also go part by part within this video. Since this message was publicly left on one of my videos where anyone could see, I don't think that the writer would have a problem with me sharing it because again, it was publicly left on a video and there's nothing embarrassing about it and it has a lot of good points. And by the way, to answer your comments and questions, I finally watched the entire second part of Dan Grider's two-part documentary. As I mentioned in just about every video that I do about the McCoy-Cooper connection, I admit that after watching Grider's first part, I was convinced that McCoy was Cooper, and I made a video about it. I had some very knowledgeable Cooper enthusiasts who pointed out many problems with that theory, including many of the things that Dan Grider left out that would seem to indicate that McCoy was not Cooper. Among the many things, Cooper was a Mormon who did not smoke or drink, or that McCoy was a Mormon who did not smoke or drink, and Cooper was a chain smoker who had a couple bourbons. McCoy was light-skinned. Cooper was described by the flight attendants and in the FBI documentation as being dark-skinned, possibly of Native American or Mexican or possibly Italian origin. McCoy evidently had a slight stutter and spoke with a southern accent as he was from North Carolina. It's been pointed out in FBI records, presumably based on the flight attendants' information, that Cooper spoke with no discernible American English accent. And of course, McCoy's ears stood out prominently and evidently his nickname was Dumbo. Somehow, the flight attendant sitting next to Cooper for four and a half hours never noticed his protruding ears. But let's ignore all that mitigating information. So comment one. Thank you for attempting to answer my shoot question. I think you missed where I was going with the question in your answer. First, I'll respond to where you went with my question. The shoot getting to North Carolina isn't a big deal, assuming McCoy's wife accompanied him as Dan claims. If he jumped over Portland, they reunited, then drove by car and stopped at Las Vegas to launder the remaining money. What was the methodology for detecting the photographed bills at the time? If it wasn't good and law enforcement were focused on finding it in the woods, was there anything that would automatically red flag the bills? Then drove back to Provo. Assuming the scenario, there's no problem eliminating transferring the evidence, trophies, meaning the shoot, to North Carolina over the next six months. Okay, I'll assume for your sake of argument that McCoy was Cooper. He bailed out someplace either around Portland or Reno, rendezvoused with his wife, and then went to Las Vegas to launder the money, which some people besides you have proposed, so that's not necessarily a wild speculation. So in looking for links to point to, to answer your question, I've spent quite a bit of time looking for information about the FBI supposedly releasing the serial numbers to banks, dog tracks, and casinos where they thought it would be likely for Cooper to try to launder the money. I saw that information a few weeks ago when I was doing other research on Cooper. I can't locate it right now. 
I spent an hour trying to find it on the FBI's website where they have their Cooper documents. And just on the point of the money, you see various contradictory pieces of information. You can find where people have stated that the FBI had to go to different banks to get enough money. You can also find that it was said to have come from one bank that had all the money set aside and the serial numbers all recorded in the case that a ransom was needed to be gathered quickly, in particular if the president of the bank was kidnapped, because things like that were happening at the time in American history. That honestly makes more sense to me, and I think that most of us have seen copies of the ransom money serial numbers, which run to dozens of pages long. There was also a reward for the money, so people had an incentive to look for it, and eventually the information that was sent to those high cash trafficking places was released to the general public, or at least that's my understanding. Again, we are assuming, as you contend, that McCoy was the perpetrator of the Cooper hijacking. We know that some of the money ended up nine years later in the sand on the beach downriver from Vancouver, Washington. Some people have speculated, not necessarily you, that somehow that money was a decoy, either intentionally buried there in the hopes that somebody would find it, which it was but nine years later, so that's not much of anybody's alibi, or else the money was accidentally lost or deliberately tossed into the Columbia. But going under the assumption that the rest of the money was retained by McCoy, and he made it to Las Vegas, and he laundered it through the casinos, which would be a bit suspicious for them, they do keep an eye on people coming in with large amounts of money, what is his mechanism to launder the money? That he has a bunch of $20 bills and asks the person in the money cage to exchange them into hundreds? Or does he buy chips and then walk around the casino, not spend any of them, then go back and convert them into $100 bills and then leave Las Vegas with slightly less than $200,000 and go back to Provo? That then what would they do with that money? They don't seem to have spent it on anything, and five months later, they're so desperate for money that he hijacks a second airliner. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. If he lost all of the money in the Columbia, then yeah, that would make some sense. But if you lost the money, then there's no real reason going to Las Vegas to launder money that you don't have, right? And if anybody who works in the casino industry sees this video, and wants to comment about how a casino might detect a hijacker coming in with a large amount of money trying to launder it, please do leave a comment in the comment section below. And again, I don't see any reason why you would keep a parachute when you don't have the money and family members hold on to it and it somehow gets to North Carolina from Provo and nobody finds it until a year ago. But again, if we're assuming that McCoy was Cooper, as you contend, Yes, he could have held on to it, and it could have somehow ended up in his mother's barn. Is it theoretically possible? I would say yes. Is it reasonably possible? I don't think so. But again, we can agree to disagree. Second part of your question. The question that you didn't answer is that Dan claims that the jump shoot was modified in a known by the feds and shoot packer very specific way that made it desirable to Cooper over the sport shoot. Dan further claims that the shoot he found in North Carolina matches these modifications. Can you clarify as to what is known about the jump shoot and whether there is a match, as Dan claims? So let's get this right out of the way. I have no experience with skydiving, so I'm not an expert. I'm not even an amateur when it comes to knowledge about parachutes. I've read over some of the stuff that I found on the internet. Do I know any more now than I did before I read the information? No, not at all. All that I accomplished was that I'm even more confounded about the shoots, exact, about what shoots Cooper used exactly. Again, I tried to find in the FBI files information about the type of shoots or on Earl Cossey, who supposedly packed and provided the shoots. I could not find anything in those documents, although I found on a website called DB Cooper Hijacking. I will have a link to it in the show notes. The link that I have is one that discusses the parachute, but that site is one that of course covers many topics concerning the case. Other information that I've read from other people is that Earl Cossey has changed his story over time and that is certainly what you get from that particular website's article. I think as far as any modifications to the parachutes by Mr. Cossey, we have to ask ourselves where did that information come from? Is it in the FBI records from the time of the hijacking? Is it from a book that somebody later wrote after they interviewed Earl? Is it 
it's just not clear to me and if anybody knows please do leave a comment in the comment section concerning it again I have zero knowledge about parachutes but watching Dan Greider's video where he points out that the harness that he found had been modified where the ripcord was moved to the other side uh, now again coming from somebody who admits that he has no knowledge about parachutes just looking at the video where he's explaining and showing the piece that he thinks is the clincher as far as proving that it's Cooper's parachute harness it looks like it would be simple to move the ripcord from one side to the other without much difficulty I'm not talking about it being simple while you're in the air about to jump I'm talking about it if you have a table and perhaps some tools in 15 minutes or whatever and why would somebody do that again without knowing what I'm talking about I would think perhaps that it would be done if somebody was perhaps left-handed so that it would make it easier for them to pull something on the right side or vice versa but I can't believe that in the entire history of parachuting and skydiving this one harness is the only one that's ever been modified to move the cord to the other side of the harness if anybody has any practical experience skydiving and can shine any light on this I would really appreciate it again in doing research for this I found this information from people who seem to know a lot more about skydiving than I do it's from dropzone.com again I will have a link to it in the show notes but I'm going to show some comments and pictures that people have put up that in my mind seem to indicate that what Dan Greider is saying is not necessarily correct and of course do your own research on this go to dropzone.com and look up what other people are saying don't just make up your mind based on what I'm guessing at this point also a couple other things to keep in mind everyone agrees that McCoy was a parachutist or skydiver it would not be unusual for him to per and perhaps later his mother to have parachutes but just because he has parachutes doesn't mean he's DB Cooper just because he has a similar parachute to that which was believed to have been used by DB Cooper doesn't mean that he's DB Cooper my impression of what is being said throughout the internet about the parachutes that he is believed to have been used and had experience with are that they are not all that rare so how many thousands or tens of thousands or more of these parachutes exist also in the video we see that the name on one of the bags was for a member of the McCoy family but when Grider and whomever he was with who might have been Richard McCoy's son Rick since the person seemed to know kind of what was in there and then supposedly you know this is at Richard McCoy's mother's farm what is the other name on the bag that they pull out it looks like FT or FJ McCoy and then of course the next one has Richard McCoy's name stenciled on it but my point here is we have no chain of custody we have at least some items that appear to be connected to another member of the family based on the name that doesn't look like RF McCoy with the FBI search of McCoy's house after the 1972 skyjacking they didn't find this stuff one would think that they might have figured out where his mother's farm was and checked that out at some point between his original arrest and the shootout or even afterwards but they don't seem to have found these yet Dan, Gr Dan Greider with some mystery person who seems to kind of know what box to look in but then seems kind of surprised that it's DB Cooper's parachute it seems a little suspicious but I'm not accusing anybody of any type of dishonesty here and again as I pointed out in previous videos if Dan Greider is so sure that this is DB Cooper's parachute and harness then why isn't there anything else on the internet about this except a little bit of discussion about the problems with it by skeptics it would seem to me that this would be the holy grail of Cooper evidence we have some bills which we know were part of the ransom although we know nothing about how or when they got on the beach we have a tie that most people believe that was the one that Cooper left on the plane but we have no idea if it was his prior to the hijacking or what the substances found on the tie really point to as far as suspects and occupations certainly it would seem to indicate that somebody that came into contact with some type of aerospace manufacturing or other high-tech industries might have been the one wearing the tie and if Cooper was that person then he might have been associated with one or more of those industries I guess to summarize I cannot tell you definitively based on anything that I found on the internet what modifications if any were made to the harness that was selected by Cooper so 
Was this find in a North Carolina barn connected to Cooper? For me, the jury is still out. And what I've seen other people say, I'm leaning towards not believing it. And just to be clear, I would love for McCoy to be Cooper and this to be the smoking gun and everyone agree that the case is closed. I don't have an alternative candidate that I'm pushing. And I'm not against McCoy as being the perpetrator for any other reason than I don't think that there is any evidence that he was Cooper. And what evidence we do know about his age, skin color, and other appearance to me and others rule him out. But we may have to agree to disagree on that. Dan further describes that the weather reports were not as described by the FBI. The weather wasn't nearly as bad. Either way, the simpler military shoot may have been a safer choice. It may not have been a novice's choice. Demeanor is interesting. Cooper. Crew said that he was nice. FBI said he was nasty. What is everyone's confidence about either? You threw out the sister-in-law's testimony because of her reversal regarding the McCoy's whereabouts. How are you reconciling the demeanor testimony? Again, when looking at facts, you would think that there would at least be a few facts that people could agree on, like the weather. But trust me, I've gotten so many messages disputing the weather reports for the night in question. Everything that I've read from that time says that there was rain. My information is taken from weather.gov, which of course is run by the National Weather Service. I just reconfirmed that at PDX that day, November 24, 1971, there was 0.41 inches of rain, the high was 55, and the low was 42. Obviously, if there are any viewers from outside the United States, I remind you that we use the Fahrenheit system in this country. But Cougar Washington, which is the closest weather station to Ariel Washington, which was the FBI's assumed drop zone, had a high temperature of 46 that day and a low of 36 with 1.41 inches of rain, then 1.51 inches the next day and almost 2 inches of rain the day after that. According to the internet, Cougar and Ariel Washington are 14.56 miles in distance apart as the crow flies and 18 miles by road, so fairly close to each other as far as determining weather. Cougar's elevation is between 512 and 568 feet. Ariel's elevation is given as 348 feet above sea level. Portland International Airport's elevation is 30 feet above sea level. And of course, PDX is where the official Portland weather is based on. And I'm use, using Wikipedia for the elevations given here, but not for distance or temperature. Concerning Cooper's flight, this is from the website check6.com. Quote, within minutes, an onboard warning light indicated that the rear cargo door had been opened and the cabin temperature dropped to negative 7 degrees Fahrenheit. It is generally assumed that Cooper jumped from the exit ramp of the Boeing 727 at 8.13 p.m., unquote. That matches everything that I've seen discussed on the top topic, but of course the original pieces of information, if it's incorrect, then people replicating incorrect information, although I think that that information is correct. Because this video is going to be so long, at some point I'll do another video just on the calculations for the air temperature at 10,000 feet on that day. I've done what I believe are the calculations based on formulas that I have found, and they seem to indicate that the temperature was freezing at that altitude. But again, that'll be a lengthy video that I'll post later. But anyone can look up what the government has for the rain and temperature on that day in that area at different locations. And it does truly seem that the reports of the temperature being in the mid 30s to low 40s on the ground and rain falling would indicate that it was not a pleasant jump for a man in street clothing and a fairly light raincoat wearing loafers. As far as Cooper's demeanor, I think most people believe Tina Mucklow and discount Ralph Himmelsbach. I played a clip of the news conference from the time when Tina is speaking from this is what my voice recognition software picked up and printed out. This is Tina Mucklow speaking. He was not nervous and seemed rather nice. And other than he wanted certain things to be done, he never tried to harm myself. And although he was impatient a few times, he was never cruel or nasty or impolite to me in any way. I've seen Himmelsbach interviewed. And the one that I remember in particular is the interview that Dan Greider did in his first video, where Ralph Himmelsbach makes it very clear that he thought Cooper was a vulgar, nasty man. Who am I more likely to believe, the stewardess who is with Cooper for four and a half hours and doesn't have a lot of reason to lie, or somebody in Ralph Himmelsbach's position 
where it's been described as becoming a Captain Ahab and Moby Dick situation, where Himmelsbach was obsessed by Cooper. Do I have any reason to believe that Himmelsbach was not being truthful in what he was saying? No, but he, was, he wasn't on the plane with Cooper, and I think that when he's interviewed 40 years after the fact, his obsession with the case is, has distorted the facts in his mind. As far as McCoy's sister-in-law being an alibi, the FBI seemed to be satisfied that she was being truthful at the time. That's my understanding. Was she being truthful or not? Certainly if McCoy was Cooper, then his sister-in-law would have an incentive to provide him and his wife, who was her sister, an alibi. She doesn't want her sister and brother-in-law going to prison for skyjacking. As far as I know, her changing her story later. How do we know that? Is this because Dan Greider says that she did? Is it in the book, The Real McCoy? I don't know the answer to that, so I don't want to say anymore. Because as I always try to point out, speculating or coming to a conclusion on something when you don't know what the facts truly are is dangerous, and I don't want to make that mistake. One thing about the demeanor between the two cases, as I've already pointed out, I believe that his demeanor was fairly calm based on what Tina Mucklow stated. There's an excellent article on the United States Parachuting Association website, and I'll have the website in the show notes, that goes over the hijacking. And while it doesn't compare the two incidents, if you read what they say about McCoy's actual hijacking, you'll see that he was very agitated. He let some people know on the flight that it was being hijacked. He showed a gun to numerous people very much different than Cooper skyjacking. Your next comment. The titanium on the tie is somewhat silly to me. Considering the route the plane flew, I wouldn't be surprised if the plane's interior had other aerospace particulates floating around from other passengers from prior flights that were in the aerospace business. Considering the interior wasn't analyzed at the time, how do we know those particles weren't on the seat or picked up later due to evidence mishandling? I heard it mentioned in passing that the tie clip was from, from Brigham Young University and a merit to this. Dan pointed out that the method of request for fuel truck location was different, but in fact the request demand for fuel truck location was identical between the two hijackings. What is the signif significance of this location? Dan has a bit of experience with aviation and skydiving. Setting aside his other views, to me this adds a different perspective and insight on the evidence. I'm not crazy about his presentation, and he assumes the viewer knows certain things, which I don't. However, if I were to take the things he assumes to be known as known, he does a very good job of tying up the remaining loose ends. As I haven't familiarized myself with the facts that Dan assumes everyone knows, these remain open for me, hence the original shoot question. So my response is, I'm not sure I would characterize the titanium on the tie argument as silly, but as I always caution, it may not point in the direction where some people think it might. You do bring up a very good point. How many particles of titanium and other high-tech and aerospace materials are floating around on planes or being able to pick up on contact? From what I've read about Tom, from Tom K., the original investigator from Citizen Sleuths, is that these particles are a tenth of the size of the width of a human hair. It may be that you test the tie of everybody who ever flew on a plane and you'd find they all have an average of three particles of an obscure titanium alloy. That's the problem with some of this resulting research because I'm not looking at their data and I'm not a physical scientist, although I have a graduate degree and I think that I can look at things and sometimes poke holes in it. I can't really evaluate their data and conclusions relative to what data and conclusions we could find on similar ties from that era because they don't test other ties. I did watch basically most of the presentation that he did at CooperCon on video about the diatoms found on the money. I have some concerns as far as alternate theories concerning that based on things that he said and things he admitted that they didn't test for, but that's enough on the tie for now. I think that the tie clip itself is one of those things where there's extremely little evidence or information about. I saw one mention, although I can't find it now, that seemed to indicate that it was a clip that was sold with the tie, but again, that may be completely erroneous. But other than mention of it being mother of pearl or a fake pearl, I haven't seen much else about any specifics of it.
any maker's marks or where it was sold. Who knows? I haven't heard anything about it being connected to Brigham Young University. What I have heard is that the family claims that it was Richard Floyd McCoy's. But again, his daughter was born in 1966 and his son was born in early 1970. My understanding that his wife is dead now. How do we know that the tie clip belonged in the family? Does his son, who was barely two years old when the second hijacking happened, remember the tie? Does his slightly older sister remember her dad wearing that tie clip? It may be that the only source of this information is from Dan Greider. Now, it's probably been 30 or 35 years since I've looked at my dad's tie clips, if he still even has them. I seem to recall that he had at least one from the company that he worked at that had the company's logo on it. He no doubt had other tie clips that were generic ones. Other than the tie clip issued by his former employer, which no longer exists in that form, if you showed me a tie clip, I wouldn't have any idea if it was one that had belonged to my father or not. And I would think that if there was any significance or clear information about this tie clip, that it would be more easily available online. Whether it was sold with the tie, that should be clear. If it was something that only alumni of Brigham Young University had, that should make things clear. But I think at this point, unless somebody can find an advertisement for these particular clips or something that ties it to a particular area or a college, it's one of those clues that doesn't really lead any place at this point. Concerning the location of the fuel trucks, you are exactly correct. Dan mentions that the directions given were very different, but he argues that the fuel trucks ended up in the same place. According to the chart that he shows, they weren't exactly in the same place, but very close. I will give it close enough. However, what I do know is that I don't know a whole lot about refueling 727s. So I looked it up and just as I suspected, they seem to be fueled towards the front of the plane. And that if I was hijacking a plane, I don't want anyone on the tarmac except the fueling crew and whomever is bringing me my money and whatever else I've requested. So I would want the fuel truck out as far as possible from the plane, which would put it exactly where both hijackers requested it or else on the other side of the plane. I haven't looked up where McCoy was sitting, but, but Cooper was sitting on the left side of the plane evidently. So looking out the window, the fuel truck would be as far away as possible and not obscured by the wing. I think that anyone who gave any thought on where they would want the fuel truck to be located, it, was, it would be exactly where the hijackers in both cases requested it. So that's not a coincidence. It's simply based on logical positioning. And it doesn't prove that McCoy hijacked both planes. And if you read the United States Parachuting Association article in McCoy's hijacking, evidently he noticed that some of the fueling employees were wearing dress shoes, which of course meant that they were probably FBI agents dressed up as the fueling crew given away by their dress shoes. Lastly, Dan does have a lot of aviation experience. I think we can all give him that. But just because somebody has experience as a pilot and experience as a skydiver, doesn't mean that they have any experience putting together a coherent case against a particular person. Dan makes a lot of mistakes and cuts a lot of corners. I started reading through a very lengthy court report on trial that he was involved in, and he practically got arrested just entering the courthouse going through the security checkpoint. I know that he has a lot of problems with his local government and the local police, and I think that he may not be entirely at fault in some of those situations, but looking at other evidence, besides what he shows in his videos about his analysis and playing kind of fast and loose with facts and ignoring facts, literally typed on the paper in his hand, should lead one to seriously discount a lot of what he's presenting. Sometime I'll sit down and make some videos analyzing nearly minute by minute and statement by statement a lot of the issues that I have with his two documentaries, in particular the second one. But what I would suggest to anybody who has gotten this far in my video is don't believe something just because Anthony Mills says something or Eric Eula says something or Tom Kay says something or Dan Greider says something or Ralph Himmelsbach says something. But when you listen to something that anybody, including myself, says, ask yourself, where did they get that information? What is the original source? Is it truly true? Even if it's a true piece of evidence, where does it lead? 
So many clues in so many of these cases don't lead ultimately to the truth. We've seen that with the Somerton Man case. If you don't know what I'm talking about, please look at my video about that case and how most of the clues pointed away from who it turned out to be based on later DNA research. Okay, I'm going to end here. Thank you to everybody who's made it this far. Of course, if you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button. My channel is not yet monetized, and I need about 500 more subscribers before I can even get monetized, although I do have the view count now. By the way, I've estimated that with all my videos that I've done, if I were monetized today, I'd probably be making between $1 and $2 a day total. And even though my videos are very simple, they take between 5 and 20 hours to put together with research and everything else. So at least you could do is hit that subscribe button. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.